Every film that I've worked on has dozens and dozens of images that rearrange my molecules. A photograph can reach into those moments where the feeling and the honesty of life is most real, can snatch it out of time to be able to share it and communicate it. It conjures up the place, the time, the smell, the noises, the soundtrack, all of those things. Photographs to reveal something beyond my intentions. Pictures can change the world. The metaphoric description of empathy, looking at the world through another person's eyes, is literally what your experience is in photography. And where it's going to go is anybody's guess. Support for Oregon Artbeat is provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Robert D. and Marsha H. Randall Fund for Lifelong Learning, the Kinsman Foundation, Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson Laird, a grant from the Oregon Arts Commission and the National Endowment for the Arts, and viewers like you. Thank you. For a photographer to make an image of something means that someone was there considering a split second and is in a really magical way capturing time. In 1839, a scientific breakthrough for capturing time was introduced to the world. Soon after, photographers arrived in the Oregon territories. The images they sent back provided a glimpse of rugged, spectacular country. It changed the way people imagined the West. Oregon has been part of the evolving art of photography ever since. For the most part, the photographers, we don't know their names. We're not really sure who they are. They were working at the very beginning of a new technology and a new art form in a place that wasn't even a state yet. The real flowering of early photography happened through portraiture, through portrait studios, and through itinerant individuals who would bring their wagons from town to town and stop in for a while and make portraits of people and their loved ones. In the 1890s, Eastman Dry Plate and Film Company introduced an easy-to-use Kodak camera. Their slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest. By the late 19th century, there were individuals forming clubs where photographers, often called amateurs, were making photographs in an artistic way and not necessarily for sale. In 1895, a group of amateurs formed the Oregon Camera Club. They looked for beautiful images on their photo outings, then sent them to other camera clubs around the world. So the Oregon images would be distributed throughout the United States and throughout Europe. And then about once a month, these slides would be shown at the Oregon Camera Club so that people could see what a camera club in Montreal was doing or a camera club in Hamburg. So it was a really wonderful way to get an international feel for the field of photography in the 19th century. A woman named Lily White, who was part of the Oregon Camera Club, would take her 
houseboat along the Columbia with another photographer named Sarah Ladd. And they would make beautiful photographs while traveling along the Columbia River. The Portland Art Museum absolutely embraced photography as an art form and started regularly showing photography by the 19-teens, which is quite unusual for art museums. Can it be an art if the camera operator is using chemistry and the sun and is not actually taking a paintbrush to a piece of paper. How can that be artistic? Whereas individuals who believed that photographs were artistic felt that it very much was about the technical abilities and the artistic insight of the photographer, of the camera operator. Starting in the late 1930s, Minor White was one of the early advocates for the idea of the photographer as an artist. Minor White has an incredibly special relationship with Oregon. He's a very famous photographer who is often associated with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he's renowned for being one of the best professors of photography ever in the United States. But it's in Oregon and in Portland where Minor decided to be a photographer. He was someone who believed a cloud in the sky when photographed is not just a picture of a cloud in the sky, it can also be a picture of an emotion or an interior feeling. Thinking about photography this way was revolutionary, and it took root in Oregon because of Minor White's influence. There were a number of photographers who really believed in the ways that Minor White taught and the way that he thought about photography, and they felt that it was a way that was different from the Oregon Camera Club and more meaningful to them. They called themselves the Interim Group because they studied with Minor White every summer and kept taking pictures and meeting in the interim. Dr. William Galen remembers a workshop he took with Minor White in the 1960s. Before you would look at photographs, he insisted on you being very still with yourself. And then when you open your eyes, everything is new and very magical. The interim group continues to meet once a month and practice Minor White's techniques. The idea was for all of the participants in the group to come up and to look at the work while the artist was quiet. And once everybody was finished looking at the work, then people would make comments about uh, how they felt about the work. In your other work, I feel like that you're detached somewhat from the subject. And these, I feel like that I can just walk into them and be in the image. And then the artist would be able to respond to all of that. I almost didn't shoot it, and it's become one of my favorites, and I really appreciate the comments I'm hearing. On one of Miner's trips, he said, where do you show photographs in Portland? And we said, well, there's really no gallery. And he said, well, why don't you start a gallery? The galleries were few and far between. So to have a gallery in Portland was a big deal on the West Coast. The Good Samaritan Hospital was gracious enough to provide a space for us in the new building, and voila, we have, uh, we have the gallery. Today, Camera Work Gallery is the oldest continually operating fine art photography gallery in the country.
In the mid-1970s, Craig Hickman and his friends might well have been considered beginners. But they knew what they liked, and they weren't seeing it in the museums and galleries of the day. I guess to me the work was, was very formal and it was very carefully kind of contemplated. And our work was a lot more kind of spontaneous. We, it was mostly 35 millimeter and things were kind of taken quickly. There was a lot of kind of visual experimentation. There was a tendency to kind of not try to hide the seams of the photograph. For instance, if a picture had some you know, photographic grain to it, well, we celebrated it. There's a relationship between a photographer and their equipment, and what does the equipment want to do, and what do you want to do? And, uh, you know, the camera has this self-timer. So we just did it like a hot potato. We set the camera and started it, and then we're sitting in a circle. We passed the camera, and it's pointing across the circle at whoever it goes, and you just keep passing the camera, and then it takes a picture of somebody at some unknown moment. You could take a picture by throwing a camera in the air, not look through the viewfinder. And if it worked out, fantastic. And if it didn't, well, then you went on to something else. Photography is about discovery. If you have something that you don't know why you want to photograph it, but you know that your little mental Geiger counter needle is moving, there's some invisible force over there, <laughs> um, I think it's really important to shoot that. If success is the meeting of inspiration and opportunity, then there are few better examples than what happened next. Well, the photographer Ann Hughes had a dark room that she was sharing with Bob DeFranco, and she said, you know, maybe we could put some pictures up or something. Ann uh, asked uh, me if I wanted to be part of it, and then Chris Rauschenberg was in Portland, and so we asked him to be part of it. And then also Terry Totemeyer was a good friend of all of us, and he became part of it. At that time, there were only about three galleries in the city, and uh, we felt like there's all this stuff going on in photography, and we need to see it. We had the space, and the rent was extremely low, and so we just did it. It joined the handful of American galleries devoted to photography, and they called it Blue Sky. Well, we opened the door, and we didn't know what was going to happen, and people came. One of the things that was really helpful was that Ann Hughes was a very, very good graphic designer. So we ended up having posters made for each show. Well, the posters were beautiful. There were photographers that wanted to have a show at Blue Sky just so they could have a poster. posters didn't say, oh, by the way, the gallery's the size of a freight elevator. The poster just had this big, beautiful image on it. So there were so many great photographers, there was no problem coming up with somebody great every month. And so we almost immediately had a really strong national reputation. Despite almost instant success, the collective way the gallery was run remained the same. I don't know exactly how we handled that, uh, you know, situation of everyone having kind of a strong personality and having opinions, but yet keeping everything together. I mean, most organizations cannot operate on that true consensus uh, model. I think there has to be something going on in Portland uh, relative you know, to that kind of spirit of uh, consensus and of doing it yourself or doing it in groups. People had this attitude of, hey, let's all Let's all pitch in and make something happen. I think everybody pitched in, and they did make something happen. 40 years later, Blue Sky still operates with that same spirit. Any photographer from anywhere in the world can submit work for consideration. This is something that I saw uh, being a juror for the fence in, in Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, and this is just a website, so he hasn't made a submission in addition to people just sending us things unsolicited and us finding things in portfolio reviews. A lot of our shows we get from books. Some book will come out and we'll say, well, this is great. and Let's see if we can track them down. Well, what I like about them is, is that he knows how to organize clutter picks. The Blue Sky Exhibition Committee started off being just the five founders. But we're now up to, I don't know, 25, 30 people. I'm amazed at the amount of 
detail and the amount of items that can be composed in one shot here. If we were, yeah. if we were looking at jugglers instead of photographers, this is the person juggling 10 yeah, things, yeah. including a, a, you know, a chainsaw. Exactly. Yeah. We have a structure where we meet once a week and you know, we look at work. And the first time we see work, we either say, yeah, this is good, we should look at this again, or I don't think we need to look at this again. <laughs> Does anyone feel like they're looking at an extremely accomplished magazine photographer's work? They look almost too skillfully yeah. executed yeah. with the idea of being clever. But he's crafted them so well yeah. that yeah. that's yeah. not an attraction to me. I think that just speaks to his skill. So basically, we keep looking at things until either yes becomes the majority of people present or no becomes the majority of people present. OK, so who's seen this before and would like to show it? Who'd like to hold it? Who'd like to not hold it? OK, that's a show. Also, I mean, it's great because we basically are discussing all these general issues about photography by using the particular examples of the work that comes in. It's like a, a graduate seminar that goes on for decades. In 2007, Blue Sky Gallery moved to its permanent home in Portland's Pearl District. This is uh, the main gallery at Blue Sky, and every month it looks completely different. Adjacent to the gallery is a dedicated photography library, as well as a room of flat file drawers exclusively for the work of Pacific Northwest photographers. Last year, I think we had more than 190 submissions from the region. And from that, they ended up picking 65 of who they thought were the best in that pool. Each photographer then delivers those 10 prints here, and they get to stay for an entire year, which is a unique program. We actually don't think there's anything else like it. Yeah, can we give a little wider space between them? At the beginning of the month, before first Thursday, everybody gets together, the work is laid out, they sequence the work to figure out where it's going to go on the walls. They hang the work, and then we're ready to go for first Thursday's opening reception. Blue Sky's basically been trying to show the best photography being made right then. And what that means is that we might one month show two American artists, or it could be two international artists, or somebody from Seattle, or, or Portland, or Eugene. This month's exhibition includes artists from Ohio and South Korea. My Blue Sky is well-known and historical gallery, so I'm pretty excited about it. It's a big thing in my career as an emerging artist. What I really love about Blue Sky is that they are truly committed to kind of showing the spectrum of what's out there right now, and that's, that's unusual. Twenty percent of the history of photography has happened during the time of Blue Sky, which is kind of amazing because we always thought we were, we were just showing what's happening now, we're not really showing history, but now it keeps turning into history, that's how it is. That's what history is made out of. It's made out of nows. The Blue Sky said, we want to bring really good photography to Portland and look at it. And as a result, I think that sort of staked a claim for photography in Portland. So Blue Sky really ended up becoming a gathering place for, for photographers and for places to see that kind of work. In the mid-1980s, the Portland Art Museum raised the art form's profile by hiring Blue Sky Gallery co-founder Terry Totemeyer as the first curator of photography. Suddenly, the rebels had been invited into the establishment. Terry Totemeyer was incredibly important to the art of photography, and in about 25 years, he carefully and quickly grew the collection from 500 to over 6,000 photographs. Totemeyer married Prudence Roberts, the museum's American art curator, in 1995. He was certainly interested in having a representative collection of what went on in this region, the photographers of this region. He was interested in having as many examples as he could get of really important 
national and international photographers. He continued to take pictures and curate the collection until his death in 2008. This is going to be a book of about 30 pictures walking through a mysterious, often beautiful section of road. It seems to me that art at its best is some way to take lead and make it gold, some way to perform alchemy. And the artist never comes up with, a, with proof that it's worth it. You never have that satisfaction. What you have are intuitions, fleeting moments of insight when a tree or a car or a house or a mountain is suddenly somehow resonant and important out beyond itself. That's what you're searching for and you very rarely find it and you're subject to all the failures that human beings suffer from. Robert Adams has been making photographs since the 1960s. He didn't intend to document a dramatic shift in culture, but his timing was right. His views of the American West have earned him a MacArthur Fellowship, two Guggenheim Fellowships, and a Hasselblad Lifetime Achievement Award, among others. Photography is very much about selecting a small slice of the world to the elimination of everything else that's around that space, around that frame, and Photographers are very careful about including or excluding exactly what they want you to see and what they don't want you to see. And Robert is one of the photographers who knows every corner of every single photograph that he creates. Julia Dolan worked closely with Robert and his wife, Shearston, to create an exhibition called The Question of Hope at the Portland Art Museum. If you look out over the ocean, many times you will see scenes of incredible beauty. It has to do with light, which is a great seducer for photographers. Uh, it's light that gets you out in the morning as a photographer. Robert grew up on the plains of Colorado, in open space, surrounded by mountains and natural beauty. When he returned to Colorado after college, he noticed that suburban homes and other developments were becoming part of that landscape. I was asked to go and take pictures of, of new developments around Colorado Springs, and I thought, well, okay, I'll do that. I'd rather be, I was, at that time, I was taking pictures like Ansel Adams. Photographer Ansel Adams is famous for dramatic landscape photos that showcase the wild beauty of untouched land. Robert didn't know what to expect as he started taking photographs of tract homes and cul-de-sacs. And I got back and I was dumbfounded. There were two or three pictures that were, despite the fact that they, one was of a freeway, they, they had a kind of uh, quality I couldn't account for. It was, in an odd, disturbing way, it was beautiful. At that time, beautiful wasn't a word people associated with ranch homes and power lines. The contradiction added tension and power to the images. This photograph by Robert Adams was taken in the 1970s and is a photograph that appeared in one of his more famous publications. At first, it does seem like a relatively simple image. I see trees, I see water. I see a horizon line. But if you look even more closely into the middle ground just in front of the trees, there is some type of detritus right here that looks maybe like an inner tube or a tire. So it's very clear that something man-made has come in and something man-made is happening. And if you look even closer into the far background where the horizon line is, you can see a utility pole standing sentry by itself. Something's happening and something is changing, and what is it? What's going to happen next? It can't be overemphasized how important his manner of photography and his distinct view of the American landscape was in the 1960s. It may seem simple now, or it may seem commonplace, 
It wasn't commonplace in the 1960s and 1970s, and photographs were not being shown at that time the way they are now. So he really was giving us a new view of the United States. I take pictures because I have to. It's just in my DNA. That was a picture that I took at night with a, a sheet film, a view camera. And the reason why it means so much to me is that it has a light streak that is a helicopter that took off and went into flight as the lens was open. And I didn't notice it when it happened. But when I developed the film, and I saw this streak on the film, I thought, what's that? And it really sensitized me to how much visual information is before your eyes that you wouldn't notice without a camera. This is an image of my aunts at my grandmother's funeral in 2007. We all went back to the home place in uh, Brownsville, Tennessee to bury her. What I love about this image is, it's just the raw expression of emotion. Sometimes there can be a barrier between an honest expression of a feeling of who we are. And a photograph can reach into those moments where the feeling and the honesty of life is most real, can snatch it out of time to be able to share it and communicate it. That's what I most get from that image, is honesty and love and longing. Well, this photo is a picture from 2005, and it's me kneeling down next to my son was his first encounter with the ocean. It was his first encounter with sand. It was like, it was a first. You know, it's an incredible moment for me as a father to be able to, you know, sort of witness and introduce him to this big world out there. When you're a new father, the camera accompanies you every single place you go. <laughs> we probably have 10,000 photos of my sons. <laughs> no exaggeration. The reason it's my favorite is, is just because of the, the innocence of both of us. It just reminds me of how much I you know, wanted to play this role as a father. It reminds me that I'm lucky enough to participate in that. So this photograph is a fantastic photograph. It's D-Day. It's June of 1944. It's the most important day in many respects in the 20th century. This is the Allied invasion of the mainland of Europe. The success of this day will ensure the success of the Allied struggle. These are people going in the face of withering fire. And so as you look at a photograph like this, I begin to hear the bullets pinging off the side of the LSTs, pinging off a helmet, uh, splattering in the water. That's what's happening. The odds of one of these seven helmets that are intimately in our foreground are gonna make it through this morning are real slim. And that, that, that moves me. That, this matters, this photograph matters. And if you don't know that we enjoy so many things today that are a luxury of what these young men did, this is why we need our history. felt that we need to know the people we send to war. And there's a statistic that says that during World War II, 100% of Americans knew a soldier in combat. 
during the Vietnam War, basically 100% of Americans knew a soldier in combat. But during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, it's only two or 3% of Americans know a soldier in combat. And so I really felt that we needed to get to know the soldiers, we needed to hear their stories, and they needed to tell their stories. These are photographs taken by soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. They were curated by Oregon photographer Jim Lamison for a project he calls Exit Wounds. I, I believe in photography, and I think pictures can change the world. And whether it's a photograph taken by a journalist um, in a war zone, or if it's somebody, some student in Egypt taking a picture with their phone, those pictures can change the world. And so I love how democratic photography has become. Exit Wounds started as a series of photographs taken by Lamison about homecoming. But the veterans kept talking about their lives at war, so Jim collected their photographs and added them to his. Every time I get into a situation, you know, I want the situation to dictate to me what I should do. And, uh, and I think that relates to some of the things that, you know, the minor white disciples we're hearing from Minor White, you know, listen to the subject, look at the subject, and, and pay attention, and don't go in with preconceived notions because those are deal killers almost every time. He's a photographer who puts himself in the background when he needs to, and whose um, skills allow him to bring the issue to the foreground, but he doesn't foreground himself. A veteran of the interim group and an artist in Blue Sky's very first show, Jim Lamison listens with his eyes as well as his ears. For decades, he's turned artful listening into pictures that help us see with a new perspective. This is one of the very first pictures he took when he was only about eight years old. And I'm not sure why, but I thought that rather than just take a picture of my family on the beach, I should go out in the water and maybe take it from a fish's eye view. Since then, he's earned shows and awards with witty pictures of religious icons in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, pictures of different generations of paintings fading into each other at the Oaks Park Carousel. And Lamison won the prestigious Dorothea Lang Paul Taylor Prize for Shadow Boxers, a book of photos celebrating the role of the gym in America's inner cities. These days, Jim is trying something new with his photography. What we carried, Fragments from the Cradle of Civilization, is a project about leaving one's homeland. When I first started working on the Exit Wounds project, I thought I probably should hear from an Iraqi person. And uh, I'd been interviewing the soldiers, but I thought an Iraqi person could give me some information that, that would help the project. Jim met Dr. Bahir Bouti, an Iraqi refugee here in Portland. I was an activist, being a psychiatrist, a professional, and I wrote articles in, uh, in newspapers. You know, people wanted peace, wanted democracy. We were going against militias, we were going against uh, terrorists. My name came in a list of uh, people to be assassinated. Uh, that was at 2006, and then that's when I decided that it's not a game anymore, I should leave. Bahir gave Jim a window into an entire community of Iraqi refugees who landed here in Oregon. And Jim's eyes began to listen. I thought I would photograph the people in their apartments or houses, and that didn't tell the story. But visiting refugees in their new apartments, Jim began to notice that each one had managed to carry a couple of items that meant everything to them. The items were their connection to the lives they had left behind. When you're a refugee, you don't get to pack up a U-Haul trailer and drive it to your next stop. You often leave under the cover of darkness, sometimes with a kid under each arm, and a few things to get you through the night. And sometimes people bring a few things with them, or even one thing that is extremely meaningful, that object that they've carried with them, carry so much importance that I, I wanted to help tell the story of leaving your homeland. So instead of taking a picture of the refugee, Jim decided to photograph their objects. But he didn't stop there. I returned the photograph to them, and I asked them to write that story on the photograph. The people who, on this project, who collaborated with him sort of took some of those pieces to the next level. Some simply labeled the item. 
But most of the refugees responded to Jim's photo and the generous space around it by filling that space. Artists such as Samir Kershid told stories about their objects in elaborate drawings. They gave Jim jewelry, teen bracelets, letters, passports, Arab to English translators, a Koran. An 11 year old girl gave Jim her Barbies. Most of all, they gave him photos. That was my honeymoon. I like it because it was the first time for us after getting married, you know, honeymoon to go and have this kind of free time on the lake together. It was nice. The photo keeps the moment. You can photo everything, so you take the very closest to your heart and mind. Dr. Booty gave Jim another family photo. Here, he notes where each family member ended up. Budapest, Seattle, Jordan, or maybe Dubai. His mother died after he left, and he doesn't know where she is buried. We have been in the diaspora, like, and, and very spread all over. Uh, so again, uh, trying to, trying to express this frustration of the situation. Jim visited the Portland home of artist and Artbeat alum Farouk Hassan and his wife Haifa Al Habib. I'm come to America only with my books. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Haifa, an artist and academic, managed to bring this book of photos of archaeological artifacts all the way from Iraq. Haifa knows that the photos may be all that's left, because many of these ancient artifacts are being destroyed by ISIL and war. I feel sad. feeling of pain, crying, and sadness is not uh, a recent one. It's kind of very painful. Losing history is not easy because it was there someday. It will never be there anymore. As she was talking and writing and painting, she was weeping. and. Tears were falling. <laughs> Tears were falling on the artwork. So what Jim is doing is this extraordinary collaboration. He's a documentary and a social photographer, but with the highest goals. And his impulses are not to exploit a situation, but to bring forth the truth, and that's something that is going to make this stand the test of time. It's a sort of incredible camera from 1964, and it, it's a uh, Polaroid, totally incredible, amazing lens, and uh, I feel like this is one of the last great American products. With a camera like this, one has to really be more deliberate about what one is shooting and not so carefree. So this uh, Polaroid, it's always been my favorite photograph, my favorite Polaroid that I've ever taken. I took it in 1997 at a place called the Town Club, which is the Matrons of Portland Club in the back garden area during a wedding. I didn't know it at the time, but at the Town Club, photographing anything is strictly prohibited. Uh, but I, I, I innocently sort of took the photograph, and I, there's just something about the photograph that I've always just loved, and in fact, it's on the back of our first album. I mean, I love Portland. I love being from Portland. I also am uh, fascinated with the history of Portland, and this is historic in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, it bridges sort of different generations, and, um, and the Town Club is my favorite club in town. Uh, you know, it's a women-only club, so I can't join. I've begged, I've tried many times from different angles. <laughs> I, I keep trying. Every year we go someplace and Beatrice, she's given me five different photo albums of where we've been. The bear just seems to capture her love of the animals, of seeing something 
that people take for granted. And it's made me not take things for granted. When I first got her pictures, it was just kind of like a sock, you know. She's looking at the sky. She's, she, you know, she's looking at simple things. It's magic. She's making magic from uh, everyday things. I use photography to almost explore my internal landscape. I took that picture for 2000. My sister called me and then said, you know, your father is dying. It was normal for me to photograph, but the fact my father was dying in front of my eyes, uh, that is a little difficult, but I feel like I have to confront that fear. Why that picture was so memorable is gradually almost like a new narrative or something started revealing itself, and uh, that was a relationship. Even though he was in a coma state, the way his arm just came out of the bed, as if the hand was reaching out to my mother, made me think about human relationship after 50 years together, life and death, and long-term companionship. This photograph is from a series I have done over the past three years. They're pictures that were composited. I start with the base photograph and then kind of add things uh, to it, which is something that I wouldn't have thought of doing a few years ago. But I wanted to create a fictional world that was almost like this one. The words were not on there originally. And then I added these warning signs. Put in uh, the context of Lover's Lane, it's a little dangerous. And so it creates this space that is kind of real, kind of fictional, and can just leave you wondering. It's meant to evoke that sense you might have walking through a strange town or a little town or something, and you see lots of evidence of things, but you never know quite how it got there. I'm gonna push the button when and when you hear it go off, we'll stop, but we gotta go in a circle here. So we move in a circle. Oregon artist Wendy Redstar is part of a new generation. <laughs> like little faces. All right. Her work integrates 3D sculptures and digital photographs. She hopes to encourage viewers to re-examine historic Native American imagery and stereotypes. This series reimagines traditional dioramas. She created another series by adding layers on top of photographs of Native American chiefs from 1880. It was really important to humanize these Crow chiefs because a lot of times you'll, you'll see romanticized Native people, but you don't really get past just seeing this photograph. This one is Medicine Crow. I started to trace his outfit. The ermine on his shirt represent that he led a successful war party. He's got hair bows. Those mean he overcame an enemy and he slit their throats. So there's two of them, so he slit two people's throats. Not only is he a very striking person and did a lot for the Crow Nation, but um, all of that is packed into that photo and, and needs to be known. Then, she invited her daughter, Beatrice, to add a layer of color to the print. I saw Wendy doing hers. It looked fun. I thought of it like a coloring sheet. Keep going, keep going. To that next one. Okay, strike pose. Today, Wendy and Beatrice are playing with another digital tool, the camera in Wendy's phone. That was pretty interesting. Yeah, and funny. 
I like that a lot. I have tap dancing while following my feet in one hand. <laughs> Wendy uses these pictures almost like sketches as she's working out an idea. We're working with technology, so it has these glitches, and we're, we're kind of playing around with the glitches. You can draw on that. It's true kind of creativity in, in making in, in that moment. It's very spontaneous. What I love about, one, photography, and, and two, digital media, is that you can continue to dissect it and change it. Are digital pictures with layers and effects still part of the art of photography? This summer, the Art Center in Corvallis curated an exhibit that addressed this question. It was one of the first in the state where all the images on the wall were photographed and affected with mobile devices. What we tried to do with the exhibit was show the breadth and the depth of photographic images that could be created with a mobile device. As a photographer, what you're still interested in is composing an image you know, that's compelling and engaging. And whether you're using a DSLR or, uh, or an iPhone, you know, the, the, that process is still the same. The technology changes in photography every few years. And for us to stray from it or say that it's not inherent to the medium or it can't possibly be artistic because it's digital, it's not analog, is like saying that photography isn't an art. It goes back to the original argument from the 19th century that, oh, it's technical, so it's not an art. Why replay that argument? I can't say that. <laughs> I'm serious. That is so terrible. I think one of the things that's changed about photography nowadays is that virtually everyone in America has a camera in their pocket at all times. And stop and make a face. The fact that people are teaching themselves photography okay. by photographing things that they're too excited about to not photograph, I think that's a much better way to learn photography than to be learning it from the sort of technical point of view of, okay, well, you know, here's, here's how your camera works, here's your f-stops, here's how you load film. Because it's its own new art form, Digital photography will have to go through growing pains and getting recognized as, yes, this is something that we can seriously make art with. Nobody would, would have asked Hemingway what kind of typewriter we use to write The Sun Also Rises. Ultimately, it's the person behind the lens you know, that makes those decisions. The heart of photography has to do with a magical process that removes a moment that otherwise would be gone from the continuum of time and lets you hold on to it. We live in like a, a photo-based world now and it's really exciting. Good morning. It's, uh... Probably about 5, 20, 5, 30 right now. And uh, we're about 15 minutes from sunrise. We're gonna hustle down to the lake's edge and try to get the uh, sun hitting the shoreline there. Oh yeah, there's the color up over my right shoulder there. I have a bit of an obsessive personality that out here, that inspiration to find and capture the beauty is overwhelming. <sighs> and we'll shoot sunset. And then the stars come out. I'm like, well, we shouldn't sleep. We gotta shoot the stars. And so we'll push all the way till 4 a.m. And sometimes it's like, all right, I really need to sleep. But then you start seeing the sunrise glow. Oh, geez, that's beautiful. And I know it's insane and I know it's crazy, but I also know that the sunrise could be amazing. And I don't wanna go home and think, I wish I would have stayed up and shot the sunrise. And so we'll just stay up. The natural beauty of the Pacific Northwest has always been a great subject. And Portland photographer Ben Canales is carrying on the tradition with a 21st century twist. The thing that's changed is the camera's ability to capture more light, more color, more range of what we see around us. We're getting closer and closer to eyesight now. Ben's photo of Crater Lake 
won National Geographic's Best Travel Photo in 2011. We're working in a field in a genre where there's so much room for growth, pioneering and innovation, and that excites me. With all the images now collected, Ben puts his camera away and breaks out a new set of tools. He uses an assortment of software to tweak each frame. That's where all those clicking exposures become important. Here on the right side, we've got the brightest images, and that's taken to show what's in the shadows. And then you notice we got these dark shots, and the dark shots are so that we can expose for the sky. And one shot can't capture the detail in the shadows and the color of the sky. So we're using multiple images at different camera settings to capture those things. And now we're going to combine them. So here's the, the five shots together, and I still have a lot of editing abilities, like I can pull up these shadows and we can see that there's detail underneath these root balls. I can brighten the highlights here or turn them down. It goes back to that idea of sharing the experience of being there. You know, we don't just want to show a pretty picture, but we want to bring our viewer to that space. Then, Ben sets the breathtaking stills into motion. The excitement of time lapse is what can we see beyond our own rate of what happens around our life. And if we can more realistically show them what their eyes would see, then for me that's worth all the extra hours and effort. non-digital cameras like Holda's and Diana's and add some Polaroids and I just like having the actual film in my hand. Yeah. But, um, Not bad for a thrift store. I got it? Yeah, I just yeah. got it for four bucks. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to have memories that I could actually keep and aren't just all in my phone. It's a cool old meets new. Blue Moon Camera and Machine is an institution that provides services that for the most part almost no other place in the world can anymore. They are dedicated to analog photography. What we deal with is all aspects of photography except for digital cameras. That's almost two centuries worth of technology and we're able to service almost every aspect of it. Jake Shivery opened Blue Moon Cameras and Machines in Portland in 2000. He wanted to fill a void. I had been working my whole life in camera stores, and they were really rapidly disappearing. And I knew that there were going to be other people like me who would be interested in having access to the more traditional technology. I like playing with my camera, which I've had for so many years. I like the control of it. I really like making all of my own work and making all the decisions. You never really print things off of your, your phone, or you hardly ever print them off of your computer. I'm going to show you my Hasselblad and my 4x5. Okay. I think there's a surprise element. It's like having a birthday present twice. So I really like the idea of having all these things that I can keep forever. <laughs> When you put the piece of paper in the developer and the image starts appearing, it becomes really clear immediately the first time you do it that photography is magic. Blue Moon's a unique place. It's wonderful that they are part of the fiber of Portland because that's another way, like the Oregon Camera Club who would send out Portland to the world, now the world comes to Portland for their photography. And photography here has come full circle. The Portland Art Museum is celebrating the 40th anniversary of Oregon's Renegades Blue Sky Gallery. I think the Blue Sky Show is really important for the museum to do because of the importance of Blue Sky in the community and because of the number of artists who have shown there. They loved photographs that caught those moments in between moments that oftentimes we discard from our memory. It's wonderful to have the Art Museum uh, do the show and acknowledge that. It, it is uh, 
wonderful. We think about much of our world and how we feel through photographs. It's a way to think about the present moment that very quickly becomes the past, but it defines our future as well. I brought in two images today, and one of them is Lost Boy Cave. His love of light and his love of drama are both paramount in that image. I mean, I think you know when you're an artist when you've really nailed it, and I think he really knew that he had nailed it with that one. The other image is an image from a place called Coyote Hills over in Harney County. You're looking at this really cold morning, 17 below zero. I think it represents Terry's ability to find um, not necessarily drama, but something really interesting in kind of an ordinary scene. What Terry Totemeyer loved about photography was the fact that it allowed him to combine his aesthetic eye with kind of a scientific instrument. I love photography, I think, because Terry taught me to. Support for Oregon Artbeat is provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Robert D. and Marcia H. Randall Fund for Lifelong Learning, the Kinsman Foundation, Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson Laird, a grant from the Oregon Arts Commission and the National Endowment for the Arts, and viewers like you. Thank you.